Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kathleen, and um, I work with IDF. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about the surveys we conduct to evaluate your IDF National Conference experience. You should have received an email prior to the conference with the survey link, and we thank you for completing that pre-conference survey. We will also be notifying you of a post-conference survey where you can provide feedback on the session and all sessions you attend. After the conference, you will be notified through the conference app, and you will receive an email to complete that survey. We thank you in advance for completing it. Your feedback is absolutely vital as we understand the true impact of our conference. Additionally, be sure to create an IDF ePHR account and enroll in the, I, in the PI Connect research study. Your de-identified information is combined with clinical data in the USIDNet patient registry, which gives researchers a first-hand account of what it is like living with PI. You can learn more and register at the kiosks located around registration. Questions will be answered at the end of the presenter's talk. Please write your questions on the cards, which will be picked up at the end of the presentation. The presenter will answer as many questions as possible during the session time. Now it is my pleasure to welcome you to Your Life, Your PI session, Selective IDA Deficiency, IGA. This session will be presented by Dr. Mark Rydell. Dr. Rydell serves as Associate Clinical Professor and Allergy Fellowship Program Director within University of California San Diego School of Medicine and is a member of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rydell. Well, thanks everybody and uh, good morning. Thanks for coming to the session. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to uh, an exciting meeting. This is actually one of my favorite things to do is to come and, um, whoa, Got a color change here to come and speak with you. Um, I always learn a lot at these meetings, as I hope you do as well. So, um, as was said, please feel free to ask whatever questions you want. We'll, we'll take those at the end. And um, I don't think my talk is going to take the full two hours, so we should have plenty of time to uh, to address your questions and and gather comments at the end. So um, I'm going to, as you know, talk about selective IgA deficiency, which is one of um, many of the immunodeficiency conditions that we see um, down the road at my center in, uh, in San Diego. And um, this is a photo of La Jolla Shores, which is about a mile from where our office sits at UCSD. Um, I honestly don't get there very often, unfortunately, but it's a nice place to spend an afternoon if you ever happen to be uh, down in that area. And I do a little bit of work with some of the companies um, that uh, have immunoglobulin um, treatments, so just be aware of that. I don't think much of what I'm going to say today could be influenced by this, but, but be aware of those disclosures. All right, so um, my mom always taught me, start at the beginning, right? So let's, let's all get on the same page. Some of this will be reviewed to some of you. Um, but let's just talk about what is this IgA molecule that, that some people are missing and why is that important? So as you may know, th these are different types of antibodies that the immune system makes. And what's an antibody? Well, an antibody is a protein um, that's produced by the immune system. Uh, it's primarily made by B cells, these lymphocyte cells that um, their main job is to crank out these antibodies. And what these molecules do is quite a number of things actually, but most importantly we think um, several of them are important against protecting against infection. And we all know that one of the main uh, symptoms of immunodeficiencies are people that get either recurrent or severe infectious issues. So um, the, the biggest one here that people talk a lot about is the IgG molecule. Um, it, it's, uh, it constitutes most of the antibody that the immune system makes. But these others also are probably quite important. And so if we just go around the, I'll use the arrow here, if we just go around the group here, so here's IgE, that's the allergic antibody, that's what causes allergy issues in people if you make too much IgE. Um, there's one called IgM, which is sort of maybe the prettiest of the group, right? It's a, we call it a tetramer, but it's, these, it's a sort of five molecules all linked together. Um, and this um, is mainly in the bloodstream. It circulates and is probably important for uh, fighting infection at some level. And then the guy we're going to talk about here is IgA up in the right um, corner. And IgA is unique in a couple of ways. You see it actually has, in addition to these antibody molecules, it has um, what we call a secretory component, which allows IgA to actually get out of the bloodstream and into the fluids of the body. 
So I'll talk about that more in a moment, but that's a unique feature of IgA. And also it has this J chain, which is just a, a joiner chain or joint chain, which actually holds these two, um, uh, we call monomers, these single Y-shaped antibodies together. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So IgA actually has some unique features compared to the others. Now, real quickly, just, just so we're on the same page, so this molecule is a pretty amazing molecule, and um, down here, we call this the FC domain. Um, this is actually the part of the antibody that attaches to cells, okay? So these things circulate, and they can connect up to cells, and they can communicate information to cells, um, and they also um, activate cells at some level when they see something that requires activation. Um, this part up here, this top of the Y, we call these fa fab fragments. And this is actually the part of the antibody that recognizes other things. So um, there's what we call variable regions up here at the very top. And these variable regions um, can, can literally recognize billions of different combinations of molecules, okay? So this is why the immune system is so amazing and can protect us against so many things. There's some estimates that your body can recognize 10 billion different components. And that could be viruses, it could be um, bacterial components, it could be um, allergens in the case of IgE. So, um, and we each have our own genetic code that determines, you know, which billions of things we can recognize. We're all a little bit different. Um, but this, this variable region has the ability actually to change over time, to learn, to recognize different things. Um, and we call that recombination. It can sort of see something and then say, okay, this is a bad bacteria. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recombinate and, and, and basically learn some things around that. So this is the, the adaptive part of the immune system, we call it. It can actually learn what's in the environment and react to it in some way. And over time, this is how you build your immunity. If, if everything's working normally, you see something that you need to protect against, and so the next time it comes around, you have an army of antibodies that can take care of it. Of course, that's when everything's working correctly, and we know a lot of the immunodeficiencies that we see now uh, that are being discovered and described and treated are when this breaks down, when these antibodies aren't working the way that they should. So that's true for IgG, it's true for um, IgM, for IgA, even for IgE, and for IgD. Now, I didn't talk about IgD, and the truth is we don't really know much about IgD. We don't, we don't know what it does. So I'm skipping that on purpose because we, it, it's clearly important. Um, we have it, but we don't know exactly what its function is. It's probably a messenger. It probably um, helps um, direct traffic for some of the cells. It does not appear to be as important for infectious issues, at least right now. Okay, so with that said, um, and, and this is just sort of when I teach the fellows and the residents, you know, they sort of what do I really need to know? These are kind of how I break it down. So IgG is probably the most important for guarding tissues, including the lungs. Alveoli are part of the lungs against infection. As I mentioned, IgM is that big molecule and so mostly patrols the circulation, the bloodstream. Um, and we're going to talk about IgA, which is important in the bloodstream, but also we know probably very important for mucous membranes. So sinuses, lungs, GI tract, and so forth. Um, I, I sort of joke that IgE keeps allergists employed because that's what calls, causes allergies. Um, and then again, IgD, we don't know as much about, but probably a signaling molecule. It probably has important roles in directing um, what B cells do. All right, so let's focus now with that sort of background on, on the IgA antibody. And um, I, I was doing the research for this talk. I was sort of surprised to find out this was only identified in the 1950s. So it's sort of, you know, relatively new as things go in science. Um, it's actually the second most abundant antibody in, the, in human beings. So IgG is the most uh, abundant, and you can sort of see here IgG accounts for almost 75% of the pie. So, uh, you know, as you go around and hear talks today, you'll hear a lot of talk about IgG deficiency because if you're missing that, you're really sort of um, likely to have infectious problems. Um, IgA is here, and there are two forms of IgA. We're not going to spend a lot of time on IgA1 versus IgA2 because we, there, we really don't think it's that important which, which one um, you may be missing. Um, but, uh, but that does account for probably, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the antibodies, and then IgM, IgE, and IgD make up the rest. 
Um, now, I mentioned earlier there are these two types of IgA called monomeric or dimeric. And the only reason that's important really is that the monomeric, which I'll show you in a second, is in the bloodstream, and, and the dimeric um, is actually secreted into this, the sinuses, the lungs, um, even your tears have some IgA in them, and your GI tract. So this is what these look like. Again, a monomer is just one. It's one of these Y molecules. Um, we saw that earlier. In uh, monomeric IgA, again, most, most of it's in the circulation, um, it's in the bloodstream. And as I mentioned, what it does is these, we call these hyper or variable or fab fragments here on the ends of the Y, that actually recognizes foreign antigens or foreign things, viruses, bacteria, and so forth. And when it does that, the purpose of that, of course, is that it can help destroy those microorganisms because it can initiate, it can mark those things and then the other cells can come in and actually destroy those, the, the microorganisms, the bacteria, the viruses. And we won't get into this in great detail, but there's, of course, a whole list of cells that do the dirty work of, of killing the, off these bacteria and destroying them. So this is one of the important roles of um, the so-called monomeric IgA circulating in the bloodstream. Now, the other type is, this is one of the unique things about IgA, as I mentioned, is that it's, it's found in secretions. And I sort of listed those here. So your saliva, uh, your tears, um, even breast milk um, for lactating women has this IgA in it, this uh, secretory or dimeric IgA. <clears throat> and then we know as you go down into the lungs and also the GI tract, the intestines, um, that you can find this type of IgA. And again, it can get secreted out of the blood vessels into the mucous membranes because of this secretory component that protects it from getting broken down and allows it to get through out into the secretions. Um, and we think that this, this secretory IgA has a very similar um, uh, role in that it um, coats microbes, bacteria, and viruses, um, and uh, actually keeps them from invading other cells. So one of the ways that these, these um, organisms invade the body or cause infection is they latch on to respiratory cells in your sinuses, in your lung, or in your GI tract. And secretory IgA seems to prevent that from happening, sort of neutralizes those, those bacteria so that they can't latch on and cause problems. Now, the other very interesting thing about IgA, which is, um, has been discovered and really hasn't been used to our benefit yet um, because we haven't figured out in science how best to do this. But IgA probably has anti-inflammatory effects, meaning that it can calm down the immune system when it's sort of starting to um, attack itself. Um, and and um, I'm going to show you some information in a moment, but we're finding evidence now that that people that are missing IgA also may have a predisposition to autoimmune problems because of the genetics that, that are involved. And again, this is, you had a, there was a nice lecture this morning on genetics. We're, we're just starting to turn the corner on understanding more about how the, the human genome influences these primary immunodeficiency conditions. And that's also true for selective IgA deficiency, is that just in the last couple of years, we've started to recognize certain genes, certain changes in the genome that will cause IgA deficiency, but also seem closely linked to autoimmune problems. And so this issue of IgA controlling inflammation, perhaps preventing autoimmunity in some people, that relationship is becoming a little more clear as we understand better the genetic causes of these things. And then lastly, you see here, promotes um, intestinal homeostasis. So homeostasis, of course, just means balance. It sort of keeps the GI tract balanced. And again, as we talk about the things that sometimes we see with selective IgA deficiency, um, gastrointestinal problems are one of those. And we think that that's linked to the fact that if you're not secreting this IgA into your intestinal tract, that that may allow the balance to get out of whack. And that could be from infectious causes, certain bacteria um, um, causing infection, or it might be autoimmune problems in the GI tract, so certain types of, of bowel diseases, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and so forth. 
So um, just remember that there's these two forms, the type in the, the IgA in the bloodstream and the type that's secreted. And uh, as far as we can tell, people that have selective IgA deficiency have an issue with both of these. If you don't make IgA, you, you, don't, you don't have either of these at the levels that you should in, in order to sort of keep things in balance. Okay, so with that context, then here's the actual definition. So people that have been diagnosed with selective IgA deficiency, this is sort of what we're looking for. Um, and I'll, I'll dive into these a little more in a moment. So first and foremost, it's an isolated deficiency of that antibody of IgA. And um, the second point there is related to that, that um, if this is the diagnosis, the IgG and the IgM are also are normal. Okay. Now, there are people that have IgA deficiency in conjunction with other antibody deficiencies. So, for instance, people that have common variable immunodeficiency, they may have low IgA also, but they have a low IgG level. So that's a, 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 a separate diagnosis, a related diagnosis, but separate from sort of what we're focusing on in this session. So low IgA, normal IgG and IgM, um, the requirements right now are that people have to be over the age of four. And that's because in children that are younger than that, you can sometimes see delays in their IgA production coming up to normal. So we don't like to give very young children this diagnosis because by the time they're four, everything may, may become okay um, because of the de development of the immune system. So we usually wait until they're at least four years old to, to give this diagnosis. And then that other causes have been excluded, and I'll touch on those in a second. The, the main issue is that there are certain medications that can cause the IgA to be low. And so when we see, see people for this, we have to sort of look at their history, look at their medication list, and make sure that they're not on something that would be causing that lab finding, other than it being their immune system simply not making enough of this. All right, so um, I'll talk more about some of those issues in a moment, but the, the natural question is, well, why is this happening? What causes IgA deficiency? And I like this quote because I feel about this almost every day that I see, see people in clinic, that the universe is under no obligation to make sense to me. It's true. I, I, you know, there's tons of things I don't understand and I can't explain to people, and, and this is, of course, why we do research, to try to make sense of it. But there's plenty here that we really don't understand yet. So there's several possibilities as to why the immune system would stop making IgA efficiently or making sufficient amounts of it. And the, the short answer is that we don't know exactly where the problem lies yet. Um, but we do know that um, it's almost certainly a problem with um, the B cells because remember the B cells are the, the type that make the antibodies regardless of what antibody you're talking about. Um, so they're responsible for making IgA. There's a, there must be a problem there. And then sometimes we know that if the B cells aren't working right that it's actually the T cells um, aren't sending the right signals because the T cells are actually the, the brains behind the immune system, the quarterbacks, if you will. So if, it may be that the B cells are not working correctly, but it could be in some cases that these, they're not getting the right messages, the right um, direction from the T cells to make enough uh, IgA. So this is a very uh, complicated um, chart, uh, and I won't try not to, I'm not trying to put you to sleep here, but um, just so you know sort of what we're up against and trying to um, decipher what's going on, um, th these are sort of in the bone marrow. The left part of this is in the bone marrow, and as I'm sure you know, your immune system, most of it is generated in the bone marrow, so that's where the root of everything begins. Um, the, the, the B cells, which again are responsible for making antibodies, go through a number of stages here, and you can see there's three different types of what we call pro or immature B cells um, that are here in the, on this left-hand panel. So there are lots of genes in these boxes. These genes all have to be working correctly for the B cells to ultimately develop normally and make it out of the bone marrow into the circulation where they start to do their job. So um, these aren't really relevant to our topic today, but just realize a lot of the immunodeficiencies that are being discussed this weekend are represented here. So there are things here that cause um, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. That's very early on. There's things that cause um, uh, uh, 
a hypogammaglobulinemia or agammaglobulinemia, low IgG. So this one here is, causes Bruton, the BTK gene, where the B cells simply never make it out of the bone marrow into the circulation. Um, but for selective IgA deficiency, all these things seem to be working okay because we know that people with this condition have normal B cell counts. The, there are enough B cells in the bloodstream. That's one of the things we sometimes check during the immune evaluation. So, now, so we're now over in that blue portion in the periphery here where we're counting the B cells. The B cells are working normally. Uh, or I'm sorry, the B cells are, have normal numbers. Um, but here's where the problem starts to develop, and I, I'll draw a circle around this. You see here, here's IgA deficiency, your selective IgA deficiency. And it's at this point where you have B cells in the circulation, and they're making other antibodies. So you can see here's an IgM, here's an IgD. But for some reason right here, they stop, they're not able to produce IgA. Okay, and in fact, as I mentioned, if you measure uh, in, in this diagnosis, you can find plenty of IgG, you can find plenty of IgE, but the IgA isn't being uh, produced. And so the question becomes, why IgA? Where's, what's the specific breakdown? Um, but that's where it occurs. And, um, and we know basically, uh, stating the obvious, that these B cells are blocked from secreting IgA specifically. So in the big scope of things, everything else is working pretty well, but no IgA comes out of the system. And um, just for completeness, when B cells complete their development, uh, many of them go on to become plasma cells. Plasma cells are the type of cell that they're the machinery, actually the factories that crank out the antibody at the end of the day. Um, and some of them uh, go on to become what we call memory B cells. And these guys stick around for a while. They're, they're the ones that are important. If you've had an infection or had an exposure, you have memory B cells that actually, just like they sound, they remember what you've seen and are able to regenerate specific antibodies the next time around. So um, again, memory B cells right now are not known to be important for selective IgA deficiency, but they are important overall in immunity. And people who are missing memory B cells often um, have difficulty. They don't make the, the proper number or the proper types of antibodies and, and suffer from recurrent infections at times. Um, so does this generally make sense to people? Just sort of, the, the, I just wanted to show you, here's where the breakdown is kind of in the late phase, but it's, um, but it's an important phase where you're trying to make specific types of antibody. All right. So, again, you, if you went to the, some of you may have been in the genetics lecture this morning. It was, you know, a very high level but important um, overview of where we're headed with immunodeficiency. And I just wanted to sort of reiterate, um, we're, we're getting there. The technology is really advanced to the point where I think we're going to see some tremendous advances in the next five or ten years. But, but just like Dr. Torgerson said this morning, um, this has been a real challenge in terms of the volume of information you have to get through when you look at the DNA um, of human beings. So um, anybody read War and Peace before? I, I haven't, I'll be honest. I, I'm waiting for the cliff notes to come out. But huge, huge volume, right? It's a, I don't know, it's a, a thousand pages, I think, actually, is what they say. So the, the amount of DNA that you have in every cell in your body, if you look at your human genome, is equivalent to about a thousand volumes of War and Peace, okay? And just to put that in perspective, if you stacked up a thousand volumes of this book, it would be as high as an 18-story building. So, so that's, if you, you envision the pile of books there going up 18 stories. Now, when we do genetics and genomics, uh, and I'm not an expert at this, but um, but the people that do research in this, what you have to do is actually break down that DNA code into pieces so that you can start to look at what are the sequences, what are the genes that are in that DNA code. And so that's sort of like shredding this 18-story pile of books of War and Peace into a big pile of DNA, a big pile of codes of amino acids. Okay, And then if you're looking at a specific condition, whether it's selective IgA deficiency or CVID or um, chronic granulomatous disease, you've got to sift through this now pile of shredded data and try to find the one word that's misspelled if, if you think there's a single gene. And there might not be a single gene. There might be five or seven different genes that are, that are misspelled or have mutations in them that lead to the condition. 
So at any rate, th- this is uh, just to give you an idea of, I, I have a lot of patients that come in and say, you know, what, what's going on with the genetics? Why can't you, you know, tell me where my genetic problem is? Well, that's the challenge. And, and again, the, the technology is coming along. We're going to be able to do this faster, less expensively, um, but it has been uh, a, a overwhelming in terms of the amount of data that it has to get sifted through. Now, the, um, the other thing that, that you heard, and I like this cartoon, you know, not going to be easy, but let's start looking. That you, you're looking for the needle in the haystack for a lot of these conditions in terms of the genetics. Um, the other thing that we've learned is that if you start looking at people that have a given condition, in this case selective IgA deficiency, um, you heard, I think, from Dr. Cohn, uh, some of you that were there, that we all carry mutations. We all have mutations that occur during our lifetime, every single one of us. It's just a matter of whether those mutations lead to a medical condition or a problem in terms of, of what mutation happens. So when we start to look at people, at the genetics of people, we've got to decide which of the mutations that we see in any given person are important for that condition we're looking at. So the, 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 the short way to put this is there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of noise in the system that you have to cut through to find the one thing that might be important. And what we've learned over time is that the best way to try to handle that is to look at large groups of people with a given condition. And I'll just put in a plug again for the, the registry and the USID net. The, the only way we make a lot of progress in people with um, rare conditions like immunodeficiency is to sort of band together and start to look at large groups of people because then we can start to see the signal from the noise, if you will. So I wanted to demonstrate that by this, this sort of busy panel on the right here. We call this a Manhattan plot. And a Manhattan plot is actually, if you turn this the other way, you'd see why, right? It looks like a bunch of skyscrapers, okay? This is, um, you know, one world trade. It's the biggest one, right? But, but the Manhattan plot basically looks at lots of people. You can see here's all three, 23 chromosomes are here, okay? And um, what I wanted to show you is this is looking at selective IgA deficient patients and trying to sort out which genetic mutations are associated with the people that have that condition compared to people that don't have it. So we're trying to find a mutation that might be important for that immunodeficiency, separate it from all the other noise that's there when you do genetics. And I don't know if you can read this, but down here, in order to find these, and they did find, I'll, say, I'll talk about this in a second, they found in this case about six genes that seem to pop out and be important in people that have selective IgA deficiency. But they had to study over 1,600 people with selective IgA deficiency. And in fact, you had to study almost 5,000 people that don't have the, the condition, we call those controls, in order to start to see this difference. So it's just to show that there's, the power is in numbers here. If you only had a couple IgA deficient patients, you would never see this signal. It would be lost in all the noise that's there. Okay, so um, when we do genetic genomic studies, there's power in numbers, and that's why we try to band together, you know, at different research sites and in organizations like this to do the research. So um, these uh, genetic uh, mutations, or we call them um, SNPs, single no- uh, uh, um, polymorphisms, actually um, do gravitate or are significantly different. Uh, in those that have selective IgA deficiency from people that don't. And so when we start to drill down on what these genes actually do, um, again, there's several different abnormalities, but there doesn't seem to be one specific one. It's probably combinations. But what I wanted to point out is something I showed earlier, is that the the genes that seem to pop out here, and so you see this 1IFI and the the, uh, CLEC, that's um, here um, and here. And so these, these are closely linked to autoimmune issues. And so this starts to build a story that IgA deficiency, selective IgA deficiency, may be related or caused by some genes that also confer autoimmunity. And um, so I'll talk about that in a moment, but that's one of the complications we see in selective IgA deficiency or autoimmune problems. Um, this other gene here, I just put it on because I, I, I like to challenge myself to say the name periodically. So transmembrane activator and calcium modulator and cyclophyllin ligand interactor. 
Thank you. So we we call <laughs> yes, we call that Tasi for short because no one wants to say that over and over again. So this is another one. This actually shows up for those of you familiar with common variable immunodeficiency. That that also shows up as a as associated at least with that condition. And so uh, again, as we talk about this a little bit more, there may be some relationships between selective IgA deficiency and common variable immunodeficiency that are conferred by this specific genetic mutation. So um, I'm not going to say much more about genetics. I can try to ask questions later if you like. But suffice it to say, I think we're, we're moving in a direction where we're going to be able to say much more about the genetics of this um, in the next, uh, hopefully, five years or so. All right, so a little bit more practical information now. So how common is this disorder? Um, it, I mentioned earlier that IgA as, a, as an antibody was first described in 1952. It took about a decade before um, physicians and scientists realized that, hey, there were some people that were actually missing this protein that we discovered um, in humans. Um, and you may be aware, but this is actually the most common immunodeficiency. Um, so even though we have a small room of people here, um, there are actually a big group of people out there in the general population that if you go looking for this, you will find selective IgA deficiency in their blood tests. And um, it turns out that it actually is somewhat defined by your ethnic background. So this is much more common um, in the populations you see here, um, Caucasian, Blacks, Middle Eastern um, populations, somewhere between 1 in 100 and 1 in 1,000 people. So not, not that rare. Um, uh, if you go to the um, Chinese or the Japanese populations, it's much less common there, somewhere between um, 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 2,000. So it depends on where you come from in terms of whether uh, you're likely to have selective IgA deficiency. And this was just a paper that was published just this year, which um, doesn't project all that well, but it sort of gives you a flavor that um, it's, it's very common in uh, North America, South America, Australia, um, certain parts of Africa. Um, but as you go to the, sort of the Far East, if you will, that's where you see um, uh, uh, much less prevalence. And, and so, again, we know most of these things are genetically determined. Um, this sort of relates that fact that depending on where your ancestors came from, you may be more or less likely to have selective IgA deficiency. And to that point, um, the biggest risk factor for having IgA deficiency is a family history of either this or common variable immunodeficiency. So there have been studies now that show that if you a first-degree relative in your family, so your parent, sibling, um, or a child, uh, have either selective IgA deficiency or CVID, um, that you're 50 times more likely to have uh, IgA deficiency yourself. And so we do see this um, running in families quite often. If you find one person with IgA deficiency, there's um, a reasonable chance that one of their relatives will also have that issue or, um, or a common variable. That said, it's not a sort of that, that predictable, and we, it's not that it's clearly passed down from generation to generation. So um, it doesn't mean that you'll necessarily have that if your parents had it, um, but there's a reasonable, uh, an increased risk of having it. Um, if your family is affected. All right, so what does all this mean? We, we've talked about that your uh, people are missing IgA. The other antibodies in this condition appear to be normal for the most part. Um, and here's one of the issues that, that, you know, I guess it's good news, um, but it can make it challenging for people that have selective IgA deficiency. That's the fact that most people that have this um, antibody deficiency are asymptomatic. And so we never see them in clinic. And we know the prevalence is as high as I mentioned, because if you look at um, blood donors, if you go to the blood bank and start to just look at this, which is what they've done in the past, um, again, we know that somewhere between 1 in 100 and 1 in 500 people, at least in the United States, have this if you just test their bloodstream. Um, but most of those people, probably about two-thirds or 70 percent, don't have any problems or at least apparent problems from it. Um, but again, that means that maybe 30% of people that have this um, do have clinical symptoms from it. And so I say it's a challenge because sometimes when, uh, you know, you go to see a doctor about selective IgA deficiency, they'll say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's not a problem. It's not going to cause you any issues. 
Um, that's not true. It certainly can cause health issues, um, but for, for a lot of people, it, it appears that it doesn't. And, and many of these people don't know that they have this. Um, they wouldn't know because they would never go to the doctor. There's no, no, no symptoms that they're concerned about. Why is that? Well, um, uh, as we all know, the immune system is very, very complex. It's the reason we've made it this far um, uh, in the world, I guess. That we're not that fragile most of the time, um, unless you have uh, a breakdown in the system. Sometimes the immune system is able to cover for that, and that's what we think happens a lot in selective IgA deficiency, is that while a person might be missing the ability to make IgA, that there's redundant ways the immune system can sort of cover for that can sort of keep um, infection at bay or keep other problems at bay. Um, and one of those is one of those other antibodies. So IgM, there, there is some evidence that IgM may be able to do a lot of the same things that IgA does. Uh, and because of that, um, people don't know it's missing a lot of the time. They're able to sort of get by just fine without the IgA. And I, I put this up sort of tongue-in-cheek. You know, you look at the Internet, and so this is like... Here's all you need to know about the immune system, right? Easy. So, um, you know, the, the little piece that we're talking about is down here at the bottom. So you can see here's, I was, I've been telling you about antibodies and variable regions and the five types of antibodies. So this little area down here is the, the antibody system. And you've got all this other stuff that actually has very important roles uh, in fighting infection and keeping things in balance. So uh, the point being that there are, there are times where you can be missing a piece or two and, and be okay. And that's probably why uh, selective IgA deficiency is asymptomatic uh, in some people. All right, so that said, though, uh, as I mentioned, we know that this uh, condition, selective IgA deficiency, does cause health problems for some people. And so we're going to spend a little time talking about those. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure some of you in this room have experienced this, and so I want to try to um, walk you through what this is like, and then we'll move um, in the second half to talking about what do we do about it, how do we try to address these issues that pop up. So the most common issue uh, is uh, infection, um, if, if selective IgA deficiency causes problems. And sinus and respiratory infections are at the top of that list. So most of the patients that I take care of with this disorder, this is really the major issue is they get sinusitis, they get bronchitis, they may get pneumonia. And so we'll talk about that, but that's number one. The second most common is autoimmune problems. And I sort of set the stage for this because a lot of the genetic work that we're seeing now, again, relates. There seem to be associations between IgA deficiency and genes that also are known to cause uh, or be associated with autoimmune disorders. So we'll talk about that. That can be a real issue for some people with, um, with this immunodeficiency. Um, thirdly, GI infections and GI disorders. Um, we'll talk about that. Not as common as the first two, but certainly can be very problematic if that affects you. Um, allergic disorders. It turns out that people with selective IgA deficiency um, are more likely to be allergic than the general population. That's something we don't actually understand very well because that relates to that IgE antibody that, that causes allergic reactions. Um, but we know that, that people with IgA deficiency are more likely to have allergy problems than people that have normal IgA levels. And then I'll spend a little time on transfusion reactions because this is actually, even in people who don't have any other symptoms from selective IgA deficiency, this is actually really important for, for your general health because um, we'll talk about the reasons, but people with IgA deficiency can have very severe um, and dangerous reactions to um, blood transfusions or blood products because your body recognizes IgA as a foreign protein, and so we'll, we'll mount a reaction to, um, to it. Um, this is just, uh, again, a little bit of fine print, but a review that was done a couple of years ago, and, and what I wanted to show you, these are numerous studies that have looked at um, groups of people with IgA deficiency um, in various parts of the world. You can see most of the globe is covered here, um, and here's infection, here's allergic conditions, here's autoimmunity. And um, what I just want to show you is the wide ranges that we see when people study this. So it depends on the people you talk to. It depends on the population you study. But you can see the people that suffer infectious problems, anywhere from 16% up to almost 90%. Uh, 
um, allergic conditions, you know, 13% up to 80% autoimmune issues, 11% um, all the way up to about 32%. So um, we know that these are conditions that are, are complications that can develop. It's very hard to say with certainty what the likelihood that, is that any given person is going to get these problems. And the other thing I should point out is that these studies are largely done in people that come to the clinic with these complaints, right? So remember I told you probably two-thirds of people with IgA deficiency don't get any symptoms. They're usually not included in these studies because they're not going to the doctor saying I have an allergy issue or I have recurrent infection. Um, so, so these are probably skewed a little bit on the high side in terms of percentages that have these issues. But nevertheless, we know they're problems and it can be either you know, very common um, to, to uncommon depending on the study that you look at. All right, so let's talk about the recurrent infections. Um, I often say I missed a huge entrepreneurial opportunity in my career because I didn't think to make bacteria into fuzzy animals that people would like to have in their houses. Whoops. Um, but uh, th the point here is that there are, of course, many pathogens um, that can cause uh, infection. Most of these are, uh, as I mentioned, sinus infections or lung infections in people that have IgA deficiency. And you know these well, but I've just listed, and we see lots of people with um, upper respiratory infections, colds and laryngitis. Ear infections are particularly uh, problematic in kids that have selective IgA deficiency. Uh, sinus problems, bronchitis and pneumonia. Um, and, um, you know, these are caused by a couple of major bacteria, strep pneumo and Haemophilus influenza. Um, so you can pick out which one of these guys you think um, best represents those. Um, the other issue that's important, though, not only looking at um, these infections, because we know these infections interrupt people's lives, they don't feel well, um, but there are, in rare cases, people that suffer chronic lung damage from these recurrent infections. And this is one of the things we really have to watch out for. It's, it's more common in IgG deficiency and things like common variable immunodeficiency, but there certainly are reports of people with selective IgA deficiency developing bronchiectasis or chronic scarring of the lungs due to recurrent infections, um, usually pneumonia, but sometimes the bronchitis and sinusitis can, you know, can contribute. So for people that do have this condition um, and do get recurrent infections, monitoring lung function is important um, just to make sure that um, you're, you're not in that group that can develop more chronic lung issues. The GI infections are less commonly an issue. Um, there's one bug in particular that can be a real problem player for IgA deficiency, and that's Giardia. Again, we see this one showing up in a variety of antibody deficiency conditions, um, but it is something that, can be, uh, that, that needs to be watched out for. And for people that develop chronic diarrhea with this condition, that certainly needs to be looked for as, the, as a prime suspect. I mentioned that um, GI problems can uh, be an issue. That could be infection, but it could be non-infectious. And um, this relates a little bit to the autoimmune issues that seem to pop up frequently in selective IgA deficiency. Now, the number one um, GI problem that's not an infection is celiac disease. And there's a very interesting link between selective IgA deficiency and celiac disease. If you go and look at people that have celiac disease, so of course that's an intolerance or an immune reaction to gluten uh, that contains in wheat products, um, somewhere around 8 to 10 percent of people with celiac disease actually have selective IgA deficiency also. And again, I don't think we've worked out why that is, but there's clearly this, um, you wouldn't expect to see that many people with, uh, in the celiac population with that antibody deficiency. So um, we often say, you know, you have to look for celiac and people that have GI problems with uh, selective IgA deficiency. But on the flip side, people that have celiac disease, there's also often reason to look for this antibody deficiency as part of their condition. Um, Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are not as common as celiac disease, but these are inflammatory autoimmune bowel diseases that can show up in selective IgA deficiency. Um, and then lastly, there's this condition called nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. And I included that as the picture just because it's sort of striking, maybe a little disgusting, but, but that's what the intestines look like in people that have this 
um, we call it NLH, nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. This is actually a collection of lymphoid tissue that starts to show up in the intestinal tract, and it can contribute to diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, some malabsorption of food and so forth, and nutrients. Um, uh, again, not unique to uh, selective IgA deficiency. We see this in other antibody deficiencies, but certainly can be a problem here. And so um, we'll talk a little later about um, evaluation, but this is another thing that has to be kept in the back of the mind if people with selective IgA deficiency are having chronic GI problems. All right, and then a few words about the anaphylactic reactions to the blood products. Um, so this is uh, an issue that has been reported in people with selective IgA deficiency. And as I mentioned, the, the theory um, is that if you make no IgA, and I've underlined that because this is important, this really only seems to apply to people that have undetectable IgA levels. If you make a little bit of IgA, even a uh, detectable amount, half of what you're supposed to have, usually these blood product reactions are not an issue because your body is still seeing that protein, your immune system is seeing IgA and recognizing it as something that's supposed to be there. But in people that have undetectable IgA levels, zero basically, um, this can be a real risk because now the immune system, if it sees IgA, says, we're not used to that, we don't know what that is, and has a reaction to that protein. So that's recognizing the IgA as a foreign particle or a foreign molecule. And there are actually a, a number of blood products that people may get during treatment, during surgery, in the hospital, that have IgA in them. When they're processed from blood donors, they don't remove that from a lot of the products. And so you can get a little bit of IgA in that transfusion, your immune system reacts to that, and you can actually have serious anaphylactic reactions, allergic reactions. So here's a list of um, blood products that may contain IgA, so whole blood, um, red blood cells, which are you know, given when people are very anemic or in the surgical setting, fresh frozen plasma, which is sometimes given for um, bleeding problems um, uh, if people, or if people have um, a trauma that they, they, again, have to have replacement of their plasma, um, cryoprecipitate, again, for bleeding problems. And then you see at the end there IVIG, um, which is probably the most relevant to our meeting here this weekend. Um, most of the products out there have IgA in them, not substantial enough amount to make a difference in terms of treating, but enough to cause a reaction in a person who um, does not make any of their own IgA um, and may have what, what are called anti-IgA antibodies, antibodies that will actually react against the IgA itself. So um, when we talk a mom in a moment about treatment, anyone who has zero IgA on their laboratories has to be a little bit careful about the um, Ig product that they get. Now, I, I, not everyone is going to have reactions, and actually a lot of people will be able to get these IgA-containing products without any issues, um, but we always have to be very cautious because there have been reports of very serious reactions, um, even with IVIG if it contains um, small amounts of IgA. And then um, allergic conditions uh, in selective IgA deficiency. There haven't been a lot of studies looking at this. Um, this is sort of a sense that we have in seeing patients over the years is that a lot of them have um, allergic issues, and I've sort of listed those here. Food allergies, um, hay fever symptoms, um, asthma that's related to allergic issues, um, eczema or atopic dermatitis, which in some people has an allergic component. Um, there was actually, I just pulled this, there was a study this year, it was only 81 patients, but it showed that 45% of the people that had selective IgA deficiency did have uh, an allergic condition. And just for reference, we think that about 30 to 40% of the general population has allergy issues, so this is a little bit higher than you would expect to see um, in the general population. Um, and so allergy is something we have to, um, we, we of course, tell people you've got to be on the lookout for, and we sort of have to manage it like we would anybody else with allergy. But the point being is that there seems to be a higher risk of allergy in people with selective IgA deficiency. Autoimmune disorders show up um, in about uh, up to 30% of the people that have selective IgA deficiency. And um, I, I referred to the genetics that might lie behind this. 
Um, there's a long list of potential autoimmune issues um, that we can see. Um, these have been reported in people with selective IgA deficiency um, with some frequency. So lupus, thyroid problems, um, diabetes, vitiligo, which is a depigmenting um, skin condition, um, arthritis, either rheumatoid arthritis specifically or other inflammatory types of arthritis, um, and then something called immune thrombocytopenia, which is where platelets um, become very, very low, probably because the immune system is attacking them and, and removing them out of the circulation very rapidly. Um, so these are, again, things we have to be on the lookout for, and this can be a real problem. These can lead to a lot of um, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, morbidity in people that have selective IgA deficiency. And uh, in my experience, you know, it's probably the number two issue behind the recurrent infections that some people get. Um, the other thing we know from looking, again, at, at blood testing mostly is that um, the prevalence of autoantibodies in people with selective IgA deficiency is higher. So many of you have probably had this sort of testing. If you go and look to see, is your immune system attacking its, your own body, making antibodies against your own tissues, um, we see that that's fairly common in people that have selective IgA deficiency. And that may be even without developing any symptoms. So usually we only do that testing when we're worried about a specific autoimmune condition. But in research studies where they look at groups of people, we see that um, this sort of points to that propensity to develop these problems. You find these antibodies even before people develop any symptoms of an autoimmune condition. And I just, this is sort of an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind. If, if you are a woman and you have selective IgA deficiency, there are actually false positive pregnancy tests that have been reported because there's something called an anti-heterophile antibody. Again, this is a type of uh, autoantibody that we know will actually interfere with some of the um, pregnancy tests on the market, make them falsely positive. Um, so that's, that's something just to, to, again, put on the radar um, for people that have this condition. It can sort of uh, interfere with some of the normal tests that are done. The other thing to keep in mind um, if you have this diagnosis of selective IgA deficiency is that it's actually important over time to keep, uh, keep your eye on the ball with your physician and make sure that you don't develop some um, a broader uh, immunodeficiency issues. Now, these two down here, DeGeorge and severe combined immunodeficiency, these are usually diagnosed during childhood. Um, so these are kids that have, you know, more severe problems that develop or have what we call syndromes. They have other symptoms, cardiac issues and so forth um, that are related to, uh, to immunodeficiency. Um, so usually these are sort of become fairly obvious. But particularly in the older population, teenagers and adults, um, there are people that have selective IgA deficiency uh, that will progress over time to develop either common variable immunodeficiency, so their IgG starts to drop along with their IgA being low, um, or they could develop specific antibody deficiency or IgG subclass deficiency, which are a little more nuanced, but certainly can confer even a greater risk for infectious um, complications. Um, so this is more of a monitoring issue. Remember I mentioned that to make this diagnosis, IgG um, and, and all the other antibody tests should be normal. If those start to become abnormal over time, then it may be that the selective IgA deficiency is evolving into some other um, more significant, I won't say more significant, but more profound, um, broader uh, antibody problem. And this is one of the reasons once we identify people that have selective IgA deficiency, of course we want to see them back to manage the issues related to that, but we also want to see them back to test periodically and make sure that, um, that we're not seeing um, further antibody deficiencies develop. All right, um, last point on complications um, before we turn to the management piece and um, this is not to stress anyone out, but I'm here to show you the data. And this is the fact that there is a little bit of um, research now to show that people with selective IgA deficiency may have a slight risk, uh, increased risk of um, gastrointestinal cancers. Um, so this would be things like stomach um, or, uh, or colon cancer for the most part. And what I want to show you is a couple of things. This is a study over time, and you can see this is over a period of years that they followed large groups of people with, that had selective IgA deficiency and people that did not. 
And you'll see down here, again, pretty big groups of people. So over 2,300 people with IgA deficiency and over 23,000 people that didn't have it. And again, you need big numbers to, to know whether there's a differences here. Um, but you do see at the end of this observation period, there was a slightly increased rate of these gastrointestinal cancers um, that were monitored for. And in fact, that was the only type of cancer where they saw a signal, um, which is sort of interesting relating to the celiac disease problems, the inflammatory disease, uh, bowel disease problems. So whether those are related is not entirely clear. Um, so be aware of the risk. Um, we don't recommend any additional special testing for this other than the usual colonoscopies and, and endoscopies that would need to be done for monitoring. Um, what I will tell you, though, if you, if you read this paper and look at the data, the fact is that you would have to follow um, what we call 700 person years. So that means one person for 700 years to see one additional case of cancer in between these two groups, okay? So, um, or you could, you know, you could follow 10 people for 70 years or 70 people for 10 years, but 700 person years to see that one additional case. So my point is that the risk is not that dramatic, but it's there if you look at very big numbers. Um, and I, I always, I like to put that in context because when you start to put up cancer risks, it, it, it understandably makes people nervous that this could, could really be a problem. And so that's why I, I put this up. So, you know, we recognize that, we follow it. Um, I, I have a good friend who has a, a PhD in positive psychology, and she tells me that the data shows that baby animals make us feel better and actually make us more productive. So as we move into the treatment, we're, you know, hopefully you'll remember more relaxed um, with the baby animal here. Okay, so for the last um, few minutes here before we get to any questions, um, let's talk about the diagnosis and then the treatment. Um, we talked a little bit about diagnosis. Um, we consider it important to, to test for IgA as well as other antibodies in people that have recurrent infections. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, but also people um, who, of course, have this low IgA finding by lab testing. And the interesting thing is, uh, I don't know if this has happened to any of you, sometimes this is found by accident, actually, um, because um, either other testing are done, or in fact, when celiac blood testing is done now, they send an IgA level along with that at a lot of laboratories because part of their test for celiac depends on there being some IgA in the system. And so if there isn't IgA in the system, their test isn't accurate, so they look for that. So we do get referrals from people who have had celiac evaluation and they've found, oh, by the way, you don't have any IgA in your bloodstream. So... Um, so sometimes, you know, that's how people show up. I got a test that showed my IgA was low. Okay, let's talk about the other problems. Do you have any of those that we need to be concerned about? Um, it should be looked for in people with celiac disease. Again, maybe 8 to 10% of people with celiac actually have selective IgA deficiency. Um, Giardia intestinal infections. This is a pretty unusual to bug to get if your immune system is working normally. So that's a red flag sometimes that if someone comes down with uh, stomach infection with Giardia, hmm, we need to take a look and see if there's an antibody or an immune deficiency problem. Um, and then the other things I talked about, so autoimmune issues, um, do we test every person with autoimmunity for IgA deficiency? No, probably not, but if they keep happening, you sort of get a list and they're poorly controlled, um, sometimes we will look at that as a factor. The family history, as I mentioned, you're 50 times more likely to have this issue if one of your uh, first-degree relatives has that. So uh, if you know it runs in your family, it may be worth looking uh, in that person. And then finally, anybody that has anaphylaxis to blood products uh, can happen without IgA deficiency, but it is one of the leading um, potential causes. Um, so if sometimes in the hospital we get called, this person had a bad reaction to blood products, let's look and see, you know, do they have an IgA deficiency that would explain that. And this is just for your reference, you know, of course there's numbers attached to these, IgA in the middle here. We, we typically like to see it between 60 and 400. Um, uh, and the, on the right side there, you know, when we test the immune system, it's always important to consider the level and the function. We don't have a functional test for IgA right now. 
Um, so most of the functional testing we do uh, in the clinic relates to IgG, that, that top antibody. Um, but to, as I mentioned, if one finds IgA deficiency, even if these level, other levels are normal, it's important to look at the functional tests for IgG because there are people that have IgA deficiency, but they also have specific antibody deficiency, meaning their IgG function isn't very good, or IgG subclass deficiency. Um, and I just listed there, we're not going to belabor this today, but the vaccines that we use often to look at IgG function. And I do think that's important to look at in IgA deficiency to, again, ensure that, that the IgA deficiency isn't a symptom of a broader problem with the antibodies. So we measure the levels. Um, if they are low, if the IgA is low, I like to repeat it um, at least once. You know, every once in a while you get a laboratory error or a handling issue. Um, so before we tell people about this, you know, relatively um, um, significant diagnosis, we like to make sure we have good information. And again, the, the technically selective IgA deficiency is the diagnosis when the IgA is low, but these other two, IgG and IgM, are normal. And um, recently, we've sort of started to break down IgA deficiency into these two categories. So the severe or definitive deficiency is really undetectable. Most of the laboratories out there can't detect a level less than seven. So that's like, you won't see zero, you'll just see it's less than seven, which is, for all intents and purposes, zero or undetectable. And then there's, there's certainly a group of people where it's less than normal, so it's less than that 60 or so that we like to see, but it's greater than seven, so you can measure it. It's in the system, but it's not as high as it should be. And, you know, a lot of people have levels in the 20s or 30s in terms of their IgA. So we call that partial or probable selective IgA deficiency. And really the difference between those two is the blood product issue. If you're in this group, you have to be concerned about reactions to blood products that get IgA. If you're in this group, not so much because your body, won't, your body has some IgA. It won't recognize external IgA as foreign. Okay, so, but otherwise, everything that I sort of told you about is pretty, pretty similar for these two groups. Now, a couple other points. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody come in and, and someone sent their IgA level on their saliva or usually it's saliva. I'm trying to think of... I haven't seen tears. I haven't seen... Um, um, GI secretions, which I'm glad about. Um, so, uh, but anyway, you, this can technically be done. You can you can take saliva and see how much IgA in is, is in it. But so far, it's not been shown to be useful because it, it, for the most part, reflects what's seen in the bloodstream. So you can get the same the same answer by just the blood test, which has been validated and is more a more reliable um, measurement. Um, and then, you know, sometimes there's other tests. I mentioned you might measure, people might measure IgE to make sure to see if there's this allergy component to the condition, um, blood counts, liver tests, you know, looking for other things that would be related to the IgA deficiency. But mostly we're focused on the levels and then making sure that there's not other antibody problems associated with that low IgA. Um, one of the criteria I mentioned is that you've got to rule out other causes of IgA deficiency. So, you know, the, honestly, the two causes here are either your immune system isn't making it correctly. That's the most common thing. But that could be that during the first few years of life, the immune system just hasn't matured. So remember I said we usually wait till after age four to make this diagnosis. Um, it could be that your immune system isn't uh, making antibody because there's a bigger problem, such as we see in common variable immunodeficiency. So we look at that question with the IgG levels and function. Um, but the other explanation that we have to be aware of is that you're taking some medicine that's suppressing the IgA production. And these are the it's a relatively short list of medicines that cause that. The biggest one is anticonvulsants. These are anti-seizure medicines. Um, and every year I see a couple people that come in, um, they need to take their seizure medicine, you know, no one does that for fun, so it's necessary. Um, but it can actually, there have been numerous reports of those drugs for reasons we don't understand actually preventing IgA from being properly produced um, and secreted. So um, if that's the case and they can't stop their medicine, sometimes we try to adjust to a different medicine um, that will accomplish the same thing. 
Um, but sometimes we just have to live with that and, of course, deal with whatever issues the IgA deficiency um, causes. Blood pressure medicine called captopril, an anti-inflammatory called sulfasalazine. This is used mostly for inflammatory bowel disease. Thyroid medicine. And then another immunosuppressive drug called cyclosporin. Um, the good news is, of all these medicines, cyclosporin is the only one that seems to have, to, to, in, in rare cases, permanently um, stop IgA from being made. These other drugs, if you stop them, the IgA tends to come back to normal levels. Um, so again, you can't always stop these medicines, but we look at the list and we make sure that that's not the reason um, that the IgA is low as opposed to a primary immunodeficiency where the immune system just isn't functioning normally. Um, so then the next question is, if you establish the IgA is low, um, then we look for, as I mentioned, other antibody issues. And this is particularly important for people that are having recurrent infections, which is the number one reason people come uh, to attention um, and they're diagnosed with selective IgA deficiency. So I showed you that earlier, but we look at the IgG um, function by testing to specific vaccine responses. Um, we may look at IgG subclasses because in some people the subclass deficiency could be uh, an important issue. Um, and then for um, infectious problems, uh, it's very important that we address that and sometimes looking with, with imaging. And so um, for those of you that have this and suffer a lot of sinus or respiratory issues, um, we do like to make sure that there's not an anatomical factor, some blockage that's causing recurrent sinus problems. Um, if there's bronchitis, pneumonia, then we like to make sure that there's not been damage to the lungs um, with either x-rays or more commonly now we, we've moved to chest CT scans. Um, so these are, it depends on the person. We don't do this in every person, of course, with IgA deficiency, but if infection is the issue, um, then that's certainly something that needs to be considered. What about the autoimmune or allergic issues? Well, um, the f additional testing depends on those problems, right? So for, um, for uh, autoimmune issues, um, this could be GI problems like celiac disease. It could be arthritis issues. It could be thyroid disease. Um, so we really have to sort of focus on what are the symptoms that the person's having and do additional testing to drill down on those problems. And I already mentioned this, but for, for celiac disease patients, um, their blood testing may be negative, falsely negative, because they don't have the IgA that's necessary um, for that test to work correctly. Allergy issues, um, as, as an allergist, we do a lot of this, not just in IgA deficiency, um, but if people have asthma, if they have hay fever, if they have food allergies, we, of course, have to address that. We've got to do the testing, um, find out what they're allergic to, and then either treat with medications or sometimes um, desensitizations or allergy shots and things like that um, to treat the allergy issue that may, that may be associated with their IgA deficiency. All right, so this is sort of the management um, piece now. Um, and I, I say this, do no harm, because a lot of people that come in with this are actually asymptomatic. Um, you know, it's been found on a laboratory test. They're understandably concerned about it. Um, but we always tell them, listen, if you haven't had symptoms with this, there's a good chance you won't, that, that you'll sort of sail through just fine. So we don't want to get um, too aggressive and cause more problems with treatment that's not necessary. Um, but of course, the management depends on how the person's doing. You know, at the end of the day, we don't treat numbers, we treat people. So we have to sit down and figure out, is the IgA deficiency contributing to problems? And if so, how do we address that? Um, so a lot of what we do is uh, education, providing information, and then, as I mentioned, even if a person's asymptomatic from this, but we know they carry selective IgA deficiency, I do typically um, increasingly like to see people back periodically. And, and that may just be once a year if they're doing well. But just to make sure that, that that deficiency isn't sort of spreading to other things, the IgG level or their antibody responses, um, because we know that can happen in certain cases. A couple words on um, vaccinations, because this comes up a lot. Um, what do you do if you have IgA deficiency? Should you get um, vaccines? Are there certain ones to avoid? So in a person that has um, partial IgA deficiency, so remember, that means there's some in the system. It's not zero. It's not undetectable. And is not having any symptoms that we can tell. 
I would say get any vaccine that you need that your doctor, your primary care doctor, or otherwise thinks is important. So no restrictions on that. If the uh, IgA is absent, so the so-called severe um, IgA deficiency, where you can't see any in the bloodstream at all, then um, most um, uh, immunologists would recommend avoiding certain live vaccines. And this is probably out of an abundance of caution because there have not been major issues. But we know with these three vaccines that are listed here, so oral polio, BCG, and yellow fever. And let's be honest, really, nobody's getting those these, these days, um, except for maybe yellow fever if you travel to a part of the world where, where you're going to be exposed to that. Um, but there have been cases of people with antibody deficiencies having complications from those live vaccines causing infection. Um, so, again, to be cautious, if you have no IgA, we would say be careful and uh, probably avoid those vaccines. Um, the other issue is that if, you, if the evaluation is incomplete, and by incomplete I mean you don't have the IgG level, the IgG function back yet, um, then for at least until those results are known, um, live flu uh, vaccine, which was the nasal spray, actually hasn't been available the last couple of years, but there used to be a nasal spray that was a live flu virus. And then in kids, there was a live rotavirus vaccine. Those, again, have, been, um, have caused problems for people with IgG deficiencies. So um, that just relates to the fact that sometimes with IgA deficiency, you'll see more profound issues with IgG. So that's another sort of pointer on, on vaccines. But the other point about vaccines is that they can really be helpful. And um, actually, a good example of that is the pneumococcal vaccine. In people that have selective IgA deficiency and are getting sinus infections, getting bronchitis, getting um, pneumonia, that vaccine can be very helpful. Because if this is the true diagnosis, your IgG still works and can mount a response to the pneumococcal vaccine or most of the other vaccines out there. Um, so uh, that can be something that actually is a good, a good move um, to prevent a recurrent respiratory infections, taking advantage of the fact that those other things, IgM and IgG, still seem to work okay if you only have selective IgA deficiency. All right, and then just to, I want to circle back just for management um, for the, the blood transfusion issue or the blood product issue. So just to reiterate, this is important, as far as we know, only for people that have complete IgA deficiency that's undetectable in their bloodstream. And the diagram there is just to show you um, when people have allergic or anaphylactic reactions, their B cells um, uh, see a foreign antigen or a foreign particle, um, and they instruct the plasma cells to make now IgE. Remember, IgE is the allergic antibody, and that links up with the mast cells over there. Um, and then when you see this exposure, this antigen exposure again, that IgE is all loaded up, and it gets very specific for that molecule, and it triggers the mast cells to fire off. And that's what causes a massive allergic reaction, all those mast cells releasing histamine and so forth. So in this example, the IgA actually acts as the antigen. If you have no IgA in your body, zero, um, then this is a foreign particle. And remember, if you have selective IgA deficiency, you're still capable. And in fact, the data would suggest more likely to make IgE than the average person. Um, so therefore, you're, you could be at risk for that IgA being recognized and then with an exposure, like a blood transfusion, that IgA becomes a trigger for the mast cells to create an allergic reaction. Now, these anti-IgA antibodies um, can be measured. And in fact, you can go to your doctor and whether they want, want to or know about it, you can send an anti-IgA antibody to the lab. It's commercially available now. Um, the issue has been that that test is not a perfect predictor. And so I wrote up here that in people with IgA deficiency that have anaphylaxis with a blood product, the rate of anti-IgA antibodies, if you do that test, is 76% in the best study that's been done. So that means that 24% of the people still had a bad reaction but didn't have those antibodies on the blood test. And in people that do just fine, selective IgA deficiency, but do just fine with their blood product transfusions, um, only 22% had a positive anti-IG antibody. So again, that means that there are people out there that have anti-IG antibodies that have no problem getting blood products. So 
the blood test is not not perfect and i don't you know you can use it i put down here you can use it as kind of a risk stratification are you at higher risk or lower risk of having problems with blood transfusions but it's not going to tell you for certain whether that's a problem um, so we actually um, you can consider screening um, that's a conversation to have with your doctor but at the end of the day, everybody has to be careful because that test will, is not a black or white answer as to whether a transfusion will cause a reaction in someone in an individual with selective IgA deficiency. And so this is one of perhaps the, I think, one of the most important recommendations generally to people that have um, severe IgA deficiency is this idea of, of being aware of this potential problem, having a medical alert, alert bracelet or necklace. and I haven't looked at this in a while. I went online and they got really fancy ones now. So you can be, you know, very fashionable with your medical alert bracelet. Um, they even have, I don't know if you can see, this is supposed to be a Spider-Man one. So for kids, you know, it's not, not, you don't have to be, you can be cool and have a medical alert bracelet. Um, but, but that should say a couple of things. One, that you have selective IgA deficiency. And secondly, just being very explicit that there's a potential risk with um, IgA containing blood products. Because, you know, God forbid you're ever in a car accident or something where you can't actually tell them or your family member's not there to tell them, this could actually prevent, you know, a, a major issue from occurring in an emergency situation. And the reason for that is that there are actually what are called washed or IgA depleted products. So hospitals are able to get products where the IgA has basically been extracted from what you need to get which um, reduces or eliminates the risk of these reactions occurring. Um, there's also transfusion specialists. There's a branch of hematology that this is what they do. They help sort out these potential risks with blood products. So ho uh, the hospital knowing that, they may be able to bring in experts to help with that. Um, and then, like I said, you just you always have to be careful, um, uh, regardless of all the precautions, just that the team that's taking care of you knows there's always some slight risk of reaction to blood products with IgA deficiency and that they can, you know, they're ready to treat that reaction should it happen. These reactions are very treatable. You stop the infusion, um, you give things like uh, epinephrine or allergy medicines, and most people will come out of it okay. But uh, again, you know, preparation is important being prepared. Um, so then back to the complications, uh, we talked about sinopulmonary um, infections, respiratory infections, um, and the management here is, um, you know, I think pretty straightforward for those of you that have been living in the immunodeficiency world. Um, I will point out that particularly important for IgA deficiency is that first bullet point, treating the allergy problems. Um, most of the other, many of the other immunodeficiencies that we hear about this weekend actually have a lower risk of allergic problems because they don't make antibodies well, and that includes IgE. This is the opposite. Um, it looks like people with IgA deficiency have a higher rate of, of allergic issues. So we can't overlook that, or, or we're sort of um, uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. You've got to treat the allergy issues as well as the immunodeficiency problem. Um, we treat infections aggressively with antibiotics, um, of course. Um, some people will consider prophylactic antibiotics. Um, pr I have mixed feelings about prophylactic antibiotics because they do come with side effects in a lot of folks, either side effects from the medicine, GI effects, rashes, allergic reactions. Um, and we do worry about resistance developing in some cases if you have to use chronic antibiotics. So sometimes we'll do it seasonally. A lot of folks have more trouble during the fall and winter months um, with infections. So um, perhaps in some cases not year-round antibiotics, but using prophylactic treatment um, during those seasons that are, are worse. Um, and then finally, um, for infections, immunoglobulin treatment. So um, this is a, a little bit controversial, but certainly there are individuals where IgG treatment would be considered with selective IgA deficiency. Um, it's a little bit tricky because it's never been studied rigorously or proven that IgG replacement um, helps selective IgA deficiency. Um, the other um, issue is that, as I mentioned, immunoglobulin that has IgA in it can sometimes be a risk to people. Um, they have, you know, that transfusion reaction to it. Um, there is an IgA-depleted uh, IgA IVIG product, so that's, 
that's a consideration if one's going to uh, do immunoglobulin. Um, and, and it's probably important to select that product, we think, at least initially for safety reasons. Um, but at any rate, this, this is a possibility in people that are really severely affected by recurrent infection with selective IgA deficiency. Um, and again, I would just reiterate, it's important to look and see if there are other antibody deficiencies, IgG problems, subclass deficiencies, functional antibody deficiencies, because that really lends more, um, uh, more support to IgG replacement. Um, I'll just reiterate, IgG replacement um, is just that. It doesn't replace the IgA sufficiently. It doesn't replace IgM sufficiently. So what you're really doing is try to cover up that other deficiency with extra IgG. Um, and it doesn't address the root problem. And if all else fails, you know, if your infection may be antibiotic resistant, but let's see how it responds to intensive litigation, right? <laughs> so that's the world we live in sometimes. All right, a couple more slides and, and then we'll take questions. Um, the autoimmune and the GI issues, um, it's hard to say anything specific about those because this is really a case-by-case -case basis. In people that have um, autoimmune disorders, um, you have to just uh, work that up and treat that condition as appropriate. And, and because it's such the gamut, right? It could be inflammatory bowel disease, it could be arthritis, it could be thyroid disease, it could be lupus. So we work closely with the rheumatologist when that happens. Um, and as you all know, treating autoimmune disease and immunodeficiency is tricky because a lot of the drugs we use to treat autoimmunity are immunosuppressant drugs. So you end up trying to walk that line between suppressing the autoimmune inflammation but not suppressing it too far that you worsen the risk of infection, which we know is already a problem uh, in PI. So that all applies to selective IgA deficiency as it does for the other uh, PI conditions. Um, and then Giardia, again, I'm amazed, you know, you, here's, here's the real Giardia under an electron microscope, and here's a fuzzy little toy that I guess you can put in your kid's bed if you want. I don't know, but um, uh, th this usually comes from contaminated drinking water. A lot of times it's from people who are, you know, outdoors and, you know, classically it was from streams or lakes, which I don't think too many people drink out of these days. But occasionally there are um, water treatment plants that are contaminated, water supplies, and there actually have been a few cases linked to bottled water, believe it or not. So we always recommend bottled water, but nothing's 100% foolproof. Um, so, you know, I do tell people with IgA deficiency, be careful what you eat and what you drink because you may be more susceptible to these sorts of infections. Um, and this is really just antibiotics for Giardia. It can be a tough bug to get rid of. Um, so there, I have had a few patients over the years that really developed almost chronic Giardia and we had to work with the infectious disease doctors to find the, you know, the right formula of antibiotics to eventually kick it. Um, but at any rate, these are things you just have to be cautious, um, and uh, if it occurs, we, you know, we deal with it. We cross that bridge when it happens. All right, lastly, what, what's the prognosis? Well, um, the good news is, is that it appears to be good for most patients. The bad news is, is that it's not been studied very carefully. Um, so we, there's, there's not been a huge study of a very large group of IgA-deficient patients where we could say for sure what the prognosis is. Um, but I, I'm confident in saying the course generally depends on whether these associated complications come into the picture or not. So if there's infections, we have to be, treat those, we have to try to prevent them, and then we have to make sure the lungs stay as healthy as they can. If there's autoimmune issues, we have to get on top of those and treat them um, as effectively as we can so there's not organ damage from, from the autoimmune problems. Um, so uh, again, m many people with this condition are going to do very well. They aren't going to have um, the things that I mentioned or at least won't have um, uh, lots of those problems. Um, we do think that um, it tends to be permanent, um, uh, at least the severe form in adults. So um, we don't expect recovery that all of a sudden the body will start making IgA. Um, for the, the partial or the, um, uh, the less severe forms, it's not entirely clear. Maybe that does get better in some people. And then lastly, like I said, monitoring can be important because in, in once in a while, selective IgA deficiency can sort of evolve into something else like a common variable immunodeficiency. All right, so um, I'm going to wrap up my comments. I like this. This is my favorite PI slide, you know, the old bubble boy, right? It has nothing to do with the disease. He just hates people. So 
you know, don't be that guy. Um, enjoy the meeting. Um, have fun with each other. Uh, and then um, I'll be happy to read some of these questions and uh, answer what I can. And if there are live questions, certainly feel free to put your hand up and we'll get to those too. So here's a question. Can you please explain what it means to have switched memory B cells? Um, uh, or if they're low, does that influence um, selective IgA? Um, yeah, so the switch memory B cells, we now have ways to look at, uh, as I mentioned, B cells making antibodies, and we have ways to determine what types of cells. So if I go back to, if you look at the different um, progression of B cells here, yeah, here we go. So right here you see it says class switch, and so that, th these, are, these are the B cells, okay, and the switch means that they go from making IgD and IgM to either IgG, A, or E, okay? And, and again, there's, there's genes that have to work properly for the switch to be made, so you're not always making these antibodies, but can make these other varieties that are important. So now, these days, we can actually measure, we can take blood and determine how many of each of these different types of switched or non-switched B cells do you have? And um, so the, the answer is that if you have low numbers of switched memory B cells, if you have a lot of these but not so many of these, we think that is important and impairs your ability to make. Mostly it's been looked at for IgG, but it's probably important for IgA also. Um, it's just that we don't have as much study data looking at that specific issue. So low switch memory B cells tend to be associated with antibody production problems, whether it's IgG um, or IgA. Um, and so the answer is yes, that could potentially influence um, IgA production. Um, a question here also, MMR is a live vaccine. Should that also be avoided? Um, yeah, that, that's true. I left that one off the list. Um, but the, um, if you have um, complete... IgA deficiency, again, I would say the conservative move would be to, to steer clear of that particular immunization. And, and again, I, I don't want to be too heavy-handed about that because there are situations where people really need to get these vaccines because of exposures or because of other family members. So there are cases where we say, listen, you know, I think the risk is not zero, but it's very low. Um, so maybe there are exceptions to that rule, but yeah, generally avoiding live vaccines, including um, MMR, um, would be advisable if the IgA is absent entirely. Um, Drug-induced immunoglobulin disorders. Is it only selective IgA or other PIs caused by anti-epileptic drugs? Um, good question, hard one to answer. Most of the literature suggests that the anti-epileptic um, drugs seem to be fairly specific for IgA deficiency. Um, but there are rare reports of those drugs being taken in people that have other antibody problems like IgG deficiency. Um, it's always, these are mostly case reports, so they're like one person that, that's been published, and so it's hard to know is that the cause or are there other, other things at play there. Um, that, but so classically, yeah, it's IgA that's a problem with those drugs, but I couldn't I totally exclude the possibility of, in very rare cases, them causing IgG um, hypogame also. Um, is there anything the patient can do holistically day to day to increase or improve low IgA uh, nut levels? Um, unfortunately, no, nothing, nothing that's been proven. Um, I get this question a lot because I think we'd all like to um, live healthier lives and do something um, to, to make the antibody levels better. Um, but so far, none, none of the you know, so-called, I guess, complementary or holistic treatments have been shown to help, help with that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean this nicely. I tell my patients, it's all the stuff we were taught in kindergarten, right? I mean, get enough sleep, eat a healthy diet, try to get enough exercise, don't hit other people. Um, but I, I think those things are all good, but, but I, I can't tell you, there's no evidence they're going to make those numbers look better, right? So, um, unfortunately, I think that's, the, the problem is here in the machinery and the genetics, and until we figure out how to identify and repair that issue, it's going to be, it's going to be tough to, to sort of make those uh, molecules, the levels go up. 
What about shingles vaccine? Yeah, um, so you guys are you're very astute. You're catching things that I sort of left out. I, 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 told, I agree. Shingles vaccine also being a live vaccine. Um, so, um, again, there, uh, there have been cases where I have sort of, I guess, made exceptions if I thought the people are really at high risk for recurrent sh um, for shingles or recurrent um, varicella infections. But I do think that th this is when IgA is deficient, uh, it's completely absent. That's an antibody deficiency syndrome. And there are um, some concerns about the live vaccines not being um, well controlled in antibody deficiency syndromes. Um, Again, that said, if you if you really look into the literature, it's hard to find these complications are few and far between. So uh, um, I, I'm I'm waffling a little because I don't want to be too heavy-handed about these things. I think you know th this is not always black or white, and I think any of these decisions for live vaccines is really a discussion between you and your doc. What's the risk? What's the benefit? I think the risks are low. Um, for live vaccines causing problems in IgA deficiency, but I don't think they're zero. And that's true for any vaccine, right? And I think you, so you have to sort of decide, is, is it worth the, the small but real risk um, in terms of getting that protection from the vaccine? And I will say that if I wasn't clear about it, vaccines still have a lot of value in selective IgA deficiency. Um, in IgG deficiency syndromes, we're not sure how much they help because they don't, you won't produce antibody against the vaccines. In this case, it's really just this, you know, this defect in IgA. So um, IgG appears to work normally, that meaning the vaccines will still work. They will still provide you protection. Um, so it's just the live vaccines where there's a little bit of a question mark about potential side effects. Um, do IgA deficient patients have low tolerance to fructose and high fructose corn syrup causing diarrhea? Um, not, not that I'm aware of, uh, but um, th there, is, um, there is some evidence that um, certain sugars like this uh, in certain people, the GI tract simply doesn't break things down um, very well. I'm not aware that that's related to IgA sp uh, deficiency specifically. Um, although, as I pointed out, there are some GI issues that seem to be of, of higher prevalence in IgA deficiency, so I, I couldn't rule it out entirely. Um, but I suspect that this, this issue with certain sugars causing diarrhea um, may be sort of, uh, you know, a true but separate issue. So the old true, true, and unrelated, right? You're, you're allowed to have two different things at the same time. Um, they may not be connected to each other. Um, uh, so I, I'm not aware that of all the things we talked about that IgA deficiency um, is associated with that particular problem. Um, do IgA deficient patients have a higher incidence of uh, colon cancer? Yes, um, slightly. And, and that's, that was one of the data slides I showed you that, um, uh, that it appears that in, uh, gastrointestinal cancers, including colon cancer, are seen at a slightly higher rate in selective IgA deficiency. Uh, again, it's... It's, uh, it's a small signal, so you, you have to follow people, a lot of people, for a long period of time to see the difference, um, but it does appear to be a, a slightly increased risk. Um, do IgA deficients have more skin disorders, eczema, dry scalp issues, um, uh, uh, psoriasis? Um, and uh, the answer there is actually yes. So the, I didn't include this because... There's actually only been one study that was just published, and we like to have you know a couple of studies before we sort of put this stuff out there. But but there is evidence um, from one group now. I think they're out of um, the Middle East, if I remember correctly. Um, the ones that showed up when they looked at skin disorders were um, uh, atopic dermatitis um, and acne. Actually, believe it or not, was was up there. Um, and I think there was one other skin condition, but it wasn't all dermatologic conditions, but there were a few where it appears they're more common in people that have, um, have selective IgA deficiency. So that, if that's something you're going through, yes, that could be related. Um, and again, the, the reasons for that are not entirely known, whether this is you know, connected to the autoimmune issue for things like um, psoriasis or whether it uh, has to do with 
infectious issues on the skin related to things like acne. The, the reasons aren't known because this is sort of a new finding in the last couple of years. But, but that also is probably going to need to go on the list here pretty soon in terms of um, uh, associated issues. How does IgA deficiency contribute to sinus infections? So the, the thought with that is that sinuses, respiratory infections, and GI infections, um, uh, as we talked about, the, because IgA is secreted, it's one of the important secretory antibodies that sort of goes out into the mucous membranes and the fluids in the, in the nose and the lungs and the GI tract um, to neutralize bacteria, to protect against the toxic or inflammatory effects of bacteria. Since that's its, one of its important roles and it's missing in this case, um, we think that that's the, probably the primary reason that, that sinus infections are such a big deal for some people with, with um, IgA deficiency. Another one I didn't mention, which sometimes people ask about, is um, dental problems. Um, so some people with IgA deficiency will have much higher rates of cavities, um, tooth infections, and so forth. And that's because, again, the saliva uh, is, has a lot of IgA in it as one of the means to kind of keep bacteria in check in the mouth. Um, so if you're missing it and those other, you know, compensatory mechanisms don't take over, um, sinus infections, oral infections, lung infections um, are, appear to be more common, at least in some people. Not everybody, but in some people. So it's that secretory piece um, of IgA that, that's probably missing that, to fend those off. Um, and then how often does uh, selective IgA deficiency progress to CBID? Uh, we don't know the percentages. That's never been looked at in, in a good study. Um, I would say it's, it's very rare. Um, I, in my experience, you know, less than 5% of the time. So uh, it's not something I would, if you have selective IgA deficiency, it's not something I would lose sleep over because it's unlikely to be the case. Um, but because, you know, CVID can become a much more severe issue uh, in some people, it is something we, again, keep in the back of our mind. And um, for people that have IgA deficiency, like I said, it's, it's worth having a look every so often and at those other antibody levels to make sure that it's not evolving into CVID in those, you know, I'd say less than 5% of cases. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, resistance to the cephalosporin antibiotics? No, that that's just dependent on the person, actually, and and sort of the what the bacterial flora that happen to have set up shop and cause problems for you. So um, there's no there's no specific antibiotics that are better or worse in general for for infections and IgA deficiency. It just depends on the person. So if if those haven't worked well for you, then that's just you, and um, they they still may work well for other people with IgA deficiency. Sure. Okay. And I don't know where to go from here because of the IG. I had one doctor tell me possibly just few on the IG because little one is not even clear enough infection. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. So the the question is, you know, what do you do when you you have antibody deficiency and the antibiotics are either not working or some people can't tolerate certain antibiotics? Um, you know, what are the next steps? And and I would say so, manospinal lectin, which we didn't talk about because it's you know in that in my big picture of the immune system, it's another part of it. Um, so manospinal lectin is. It's not important. It's up there somewhere. Um, the, uh, that's another immune deficiency that in and of itself probably isn't so important, but when you start combining it with other problems like IgA deficiency, actually may be important. It's sort of, you know, you have a wall, and the more bricks you're missing, the more problems you start to have. Um, so that that's a becomes a more complex issue. 
Um, the issue with antibiotics in, in PI is, as I'm, I'm telling you guys things you know, but is a really difficult one because we know that, yes, you're not always going to have the same symptoms that a normal immune, uh, immunologic person may have, including fevers and white counts and all that. Um, and we want to be aggressive about treating infections because we know if we wait too long, they can get really um, serious and severe. So uh, on the individual basis, we want to treat with antibiotics as much as we can. The, the downward pressure, though, is, of course, on a societal basis, we're being told, don't use antibiotics, right, because we're, we're running out of antibiotics. You know, there, it's actually frightening, truthfully, to look at where we stand. There, there are very few new antibiotics coming, and there are lots more resistant bugs coming. And so um, it's a little bit um, scary in that regard. But at any rate, um, so, so that's a conundrum. Um, I treat all my PI patients early and often with antibiotics. I still do because I think my job is to keep that person as healthy as I can. Um, it, with regard to your question where you sort of get in the situation where either you can't take certain antibiotics or they're not working that well, um, you know, that, that is a situation where one might consider the immunoglobulin treatments, even, even for selective IgA deficiency. And to be fair, I don't use immunoglobulin that much in this condition because we can usually get away with using uh, other routes. Um, but if, if you are um, having issues with antibiotics or they're not working and you're getting sick a lot, then that's a situation where we might think about uh, Ig replacement. Um, and... The, what I would say about that is if you have absent IgA, either the, there's an IV product that has uh, depleted IgA, low IgA amounts, or the, the data suggests that sub-Q treatment has been um, quite safe. Um, now, the FDA labeling still says don't use this in people that have no IgA, uh, but the, the studies on subcutaneous immunoglobulin in people that, don't, that are missing IgA has actually not shown um, safety issues. Um, so it looks like people tolerate that IgA being given um, within the IgG product when it's given sub-Q much better than if you give it intravenously. It's just the way that the immune system reacts to these things. Um, well, any of the subcutaneous um, immunoglobulin products. So there's there's one called Hyzentra, there's one called Cubitu, Gamunex, Gamma Guard. There's actually several of them out there. Um, so uh, anyway, that again, you have to sit down with your doc and talk about your situation. I can't tell you the, the specifics on that. But, um, but that would be a consideration because the sub-Q um, appears to be a safer way to go if you're at that point where that has to be tried. Any last questions? All right, you got an extra 15-minute break, so that's not so bad. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.